These are some of the most mind-boggling stories that never should have happened. Typically, when medical procedures are performed, we hope the mortality rate is zero. But that isn't always the case. In fact, while you might imagine that a mortality rate can't ever be over 100% for a procedure, one doctor actually managed to perform a surgery with a 300% mortality rate. That doctor's name is Robert Liston, and this is that story. Robert Liston was a surgeon from the times before anesthesia, which made the job even more difficult. One of the best ways to do surgeries back then was to just go as fast as humanly possible. That's less pain for the patient over a smaller amount of time. Robert Liston was one of the fastest surgeons in the world, even having the nickname the fastest knife on West End. Liston was famous for quick amputations, where he only lost one in 10 men, where most surgeons at his time period would lose one in four. Liston could famously amputate a leg in about two and a half minutes, even performing one amputation in just 28 seconds. Before every surgery, Liston would say, time me, gentlemen, which became his iconic catchphrase. However, not all of Liston's surgeries went according to plan. He was performing a leg amputation on one patient and was so laser focused on being fast that he forgot his assistant had hands. In his first swoop, he took off his assistant's fingers along with the patient's legs. Realizing his mistake, he quickly jerked the knife upwards, on its way snagging a spectator to the surgery's coattails. The spectator died on the spot, later to be found from shock. Liston finished the amputation successfully, but the patient in Liston's assistant's wounds became severely infected and both soon died. Liston successfully, or unsuccessfully, had just performed the deadliest surgery on a single person in history. A surgery on one person that resulted in the deaths of three. It's the only surgery with a recorded mortality rate of 300%. Liston did continue practicing amputations, and he was still one of the best. However, he had a number of other mishaps. In another amputation, he did make the cut just a tad bit too high in his excitement, accidentally cutting off one of his patient's manhood along with his leg. Rather unfortunate. He also mistook a lump in a boy's skin as a skin tag, and after removing it, he discovered it was actually an aneurysm of the carotid artery, and the boy died. Later on, Liston became one of the first surgeons to operate with anesthesia, and died a distinguished surgeon. This is the story of the deadliest energy drink in history. The story starts with a man named Ebenezer Byers. He was a famous American socialite in the 1920s, and he was the son of the industrialist Alexander Byers. So his life was not short of privilege and money. But an accident would soon happen. In 1927, while returning from a football game at Yale, he ended up falling out of an upper bunk on his train and hurt his arm. He had access to top doctors, but despite this, he couldn't get rid of the persistent pain resulting from this fall. That is, until he tried a new energy drink that was all the rage at the time. At the recommendation of a doctor in Pittsburgh, Ebenezer Byers started drinking something named Radithor. This was a patented energy drink-like medicine that was made up of distilled water and just the slightest bit of an element called radium. Byers began to take the drink for his pain, and he began feeling invigorated and full of energy. His pain would fade, and he could not stop raving of this new energy drink that was a miracle cure. The drink was invented by a man named William Bailey, a Harvard dropout who claimed to be a doctor of medicine. He, like many doctors of the time, promoted Radithor as a metabolic stimulant and an aphrodisiac. He went on to claim that the radioactive elements inside stimulated human organs and prevented adrenal fatigue and could cure other things like diabetes, anemia, constipation, and more. Just imagine if that's what Prime or Monster Energy Drinks had written on the can. 
Radithor, as a medicine and energy drink, came in half-ounce bottles that contained one microcurie of radium-228 and radium-226 each. At the time, it only cost people $30. So, it was pricey, but you could get your hands on one with a little bit of cash. In the end, because Byers loved it so much, he ended up receiving the cure and drinking it more than three times a day, every day, until he was 50. It was at this age that the effects of drinking radium for more than several decades started to show. He started quickly losing weight, getting severe headaches, and his teeth started falling out. An x-ray specialist based in Manhattan who had treated people for radium poisoning before immediately knew what was wrong. The Federal Trade Commission began investigating Radithor. Although Byers was relatively young at this time, just 50, he could barely speak and was covered in bandages. Prior to his diagnosis, his entire lower jaw had to be removed, and he was only left with two front teeth. All of his tissue was starting to disintegrate, and he was growing holes in his skull. Six months after the investigation started, Byers passed away. An autopsy revealed that his kidneys had failed, and inside of his bones there were 36 micrograms of radium. Of note, just 10 micrograms is considered to be a fatal dose. Byers' death ended up gaining quite a bit of publicity because he was somewhat famous at the time. The media made him to be the poster child of the dangers of radium poisoning, but many across the U.S. and the world continued to believe in the marketing of radium-based medicine. The doctor that actually gave Byers the medicine claimed to have drunk more Radithor than Ebenezer and claimed it had nothing to do with his death. For the most part, though, all of this fell on deaf ears. By December of that year, Radithor ended up being banned in the United States, but no one was ever tried for the death of Ebenezer Byers. So this is the perplexing story of the deadliest energy drink in history to think. Less than 100 years ago, doctors thought that ingesting radioactive isotopes in your drink could cure headaches and, frankly, any disease you'd like. How did this ship get here? This is one of the most famous and peculiar shipwrecks in history, and it dates back to 1910. This is the Princess May, which was sailing off the coast of Skagway, Alaska on August 5th, 1910. Aboard were 68 crew and 80 passengers, carrying a giant load of gold from the Alaskan gold mines. But there was immense fog on this day, and the ship was traveling at its top speed of 10 knots to navigate through the treacherous Lynn Canal. But when it was, the ship hit an underwater reef off of Sentinel Island, and because the ship was traveling at such high speed, its momentum carried it up and over the rocks, resting precariously on the outcrop. But the ship had bigger problems for the moment. For the rocks breached the hull, and a portion of the ship that was underwater began filling with it. The ship risked rolling and sinking on the reef. The radio operator sent out an SOS call. SS Princess May sinking, Sentinel Island, send help. While in the meantime, the crew that was remaining began securing the leaks. Luckily, a nearby ship called Princess Ina was nearby and was able to come rescue all of the passengers and crew. But what was the fate of the Princess May, now perched atop these rocks. Nearly a month later, a crew welded steel plates along the damaged hull, refloated her, and sailed her back to port. The Princess May resumed her normal operational duties in 1911. So, while not the most deadly shipwreck, or even the most exciting, it is perhaps the most peculiar shipwreck in history. One where the ship not only didn't sink, but rather rose above the tides and rested on a small hill. Known now as the Goldsboro Incident, in the middle of the night on the 23rd of January 1961, a B-52 Stratofortress was flying over the skies of the Atlantic near the U.S. coast. The plane developed a fuel leak and was directed to fly towards Goldsboro, North Carolina, to land at nearby Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. However, 
As they had just crossed over land from the sea, the pilots lost control of the plane and had to bail out of the craft. Only five crew members successfully parachuted out. The rest died in the crash. This wasn't an ordinary flight for the B-52 and the crew, though. Nor would it be an ordinary crash. On board the plane were two 3.8 megaton thermonuclear bombs. After the crew lost control of the plane and it began falling to the earth, it broke up and the two bombs separated from their attachments in the bays. They fell to the ground over North Carolina. At this point, you're probably thinking about that massive irradiated zone in North Carolina that no one's allowed to go to because those nuclear bombs exploded back in the day. Except that that doesn't exist, as you can probably guess, the bombs never detonated. The morning after the crash, investigators found that one of the bombs had successfully deployed its parachute, and the other had fallen into a group of trees. The one that fell into the trees fell at such a high rate of speed, it was 18 feet under the surface of the earth when the crews found it. Luckily for everyone in North Carolina, the core of the weapons remained intact, and there was no radiation leaking. The military at the time made sure to keep the public calm, but records now indicate that experts were rather concerned that one of the bombs would end up detonating due to accidental arming during the crash. This little tidbit of how close North Carolina came to being nuked wasn't really known until 2013 when author Eric Slosser acquired documents under the FIA, or the Freedom of Information Act. The documents detailed an alarming fact, that five out of the six total safety mechanisms the bomb had on board had become disarmed during the fall and crash. If the last one had unlocked, the bomb likely would have exploded. It was one 1960s-era dynamo low-voltage switch that kept the bomb from detonating. To give some perspective on how bad this would have been, the bombs that fell in Greensboro were 250 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The fireball from the bomb would have been 2 kilometers in diameter, and third-degree burns would have registered on human skin up to 19 kilometers away, not to mention the massive amount of radiation that would have leaked across the U.S. All of this said, there's some dispute to the claim that the bomb almost detonated by other researchers, believing that there were a few other safety mechanisms in place that would have kept the bomb from exploding. A debate can be had about the actual probability, but regardless, two nukes fell from the sky and dropped on North Carolina in 1961. The bomb that landed without a parachute actually broke up into several pieces, with one piece containing a significant amount of enriched uranium, which was never found. Between 1950 and 1968, the Goldsboro incident really wasn't that unique. There were 700 documented similarly significant nuclear accidents in that nearly 20-year span, with many arguably coming closer to detonation than Goldsboro. While now, in hindsight, we can recognize that the U.S. never accidentally nuked itself, it should be noted how many times the United States did come close to detonating thermonuclear weapons on their own citizens. Accidentally, of course. There truly are 1,000 ways to die. You could die by falling out of bed in the morning, you could get struck by lightning, you could forget to eat while binge-watching concerning reality videos, or you could drown after falling through several floors in a building into a giant pool of human excrement. The latter is exactly what happened to a group of nobles from across the Roman Empire in the year 1184. Called the Erfurt Latrine Disaster, about 60 people died in the accident, with most dying by drowning in what can only be described as a massive cesspool of years of human excrement underneath the Church of St. Peter in what is now central Germany. Notably, one of the people that survived the incident was King Henry VI, King of the Romans and eventual Roman Emperor. The story behind why 60 people died in a giant septic tank is wild, but the story goes something like this. 
Louis III, the Landgrave of Thuringia, and Archbishop Conrad of Mainz were feuding over what nobles feuded about back in the 1100s. Land, money, and power. These two nobles, while at odds with each other, held a respectable amount of power in the region which worried the King of the Romans. King Henry was passing through the region while he was on a conquest in Poland and decided that he needed to put this feud to bed once and for all. He decided to call a meeting in the town of Erfurt to mediate the situation between the two nobles. He also invited a number of other nobles in the region to help in the discussions. What better place to hold these discussions than in a church? Or so thought King Henry. King Henry had everyone gather on the upper floor of the Church of St. Peter's Monastery in Erfurt. While the exact number of people that gathered here isn't known, what is known is that there were more than 100 people gathered on the upper level of the church that day. Being an old monastery, though, meant that the beams of the building had become rotten and weren't exactly designed to hold this many people. But at this point, you might be wondering, how did a large gathering of people on the top floor of a church lead to more than half of them drowning in human excrement? Well, there's something you should know about medieval plumbing. The toilets of medieval buildings consisted of openings which led to a small channel that carried the waste into a rather large pit. Now, this pit wasn't anything but a pit. It wasn't cleaned or drained, rather it was a pit that, when it eventually filled up, would be capped off in another pit dug to hold the waste. The pit of St. Peter's Church was directly below the meeting room a few floors down. Ah, foreshadowing. Back to the meeting room where everyone had gathered. The floor was struggling and eventually broke, causing the large group to start falling from the top floor. However, there was still a second floor below them. The weight of the top floor was so great that the rubble and people hitting the second floor caused the second floor to break apart too, sending the group even further into the building. The group then found themselves in the room of the latrines, albeit briefly. When the group, along with two floors of rubble, hit the floor of the latrines, it broke too, opening up the pit. This pit would have been filled with years of excrement, meaning that most who survived the fall would have drowned in the thick sludge or died later of infection. Some died in the fall, though, or were struck with large rubble after they landed. A significant portion of the region's nobility at the time died in this accident by drowning in the pit. But notably, King Henry didn't, for he was sitting on a windowsill during the meeting and thus didn't fall when the floor gave out, almost like he knew it was going to give way. And after all of that, the dispute was settled, largely because everyone had drowned in a sewage pit. But we can look on the bright side. After the incident, King Henry VI went on to complete his conquest of Poland and became the Emperor of the Romans, following in his father's steps. On the morning of December 5th, 1952, the people of London woke up to their typical foggy city. The weather that day, though, was unusually cold, and there was practically no wind. Unbeknownst to the citizens at the time, though, this wasn't their normal fog, and it wouldn't leave until Tuesday, December 9th, four days later. Sitting above the city was something called an anticyclone, which is a weather event that causes a particular area to be overly calm, caused by cyclical winds around that area, trapping the centered air inside. Londoners already used to their foggy city first went about their days as normal, but when the fog didn't go away and started to feel more and more toxic, Londoners knew something was wrong. Massive smog events like this were known in London as pea supers because of how thick and slow flowing they made the air. This event, though, in December of 1952, was much worse than previous events and would become known as the Great Smog of London. 
Roughly 4 to 12,000 people would die over the next four days, many from respiratory issues and many from actually falling into the River Thames and drowning. While this may sound absurd, the smog over these four days was so thick that people couldn't even see their own feet, causing many to fall into the river accidentally while just trying to get across town. But why did the Great Smog happen? The exact cause wasn't actually concretely known until recently. London has suffered from poor air quality ever since it began industrializing in the 13th century. The heavily populated city with its cool, humid climate was and is the perfect creator of dense fog and smog. But on the days before the Great Smog, there was a particularly cold weather front moving in, causing Londoners to burn more coal to heat their homes, creating more smoke. During the Great Smog, it's estimated that each day, 1,000 tons of smoke particles, 140 tons of hydrochloric acid, 14 tons of fluorine compounds, 370 tons of sulfur dioxide, and 800 tons of sulfuric acid were emitted from chimneys in the city from the burning of coal to keep houses warm. This was a deadly cocktail that normally would be swept away by winds. But there was an anti-cyclone over the city, preventing the movement of air throughout. The fog in London was also incredibly dense, with the water droplets being large enough to facilitate intense sulfate reactions, causing the fog itself to become highly acidic. The Great Smog practically shut down the city. Public transport was stopped, ambulance services stopped, concert and film screenings were canceled, everything stopped. Because of the fog, it was initially estimated that 4,000 people had died, but this was later raised to 6,000 and 25,000 more people had gotten sick because of it. Mortality in London was raised for months after the fog. People died of influenza, respiratory tract infections, hypoxia, or they drowned in their own pus that arose from lung infections. Modern researchers today, though, in studying the event, now place the death count over 12,000. Modern researchers are also why we know the fog became highly acidic and examined the exact chemical processes that caused the fog to occur back in 1952. The Great Smog of 1952 also caused the creation of the Clean Air Acts of 1956 and eventually 1968, leading ultimately to the reduction of air pollution in the United Kingdom.